these are my expectations. This is what I expect you will have some understanding about by the end of this session. Um, the word there is attachment, and that is the context, uh, the theory of learning, of development that I'm going to explore a little bit behind why some learners can't achieve. And then to help you understand some of the clues that tell you that somebody, a learner, a student, might have attachment difficulties. And then perhaps reflect on their needs differently. But, like any good researcher, you have to set out your own bias. And I have to say to you that I believe there are lots and lots of different ways to manage behaviour, to manage learning, to manage the things going on. And the best way is to prevent inappropriate or challenging behaviour is to prevent it, stop it in the beginning. What do I mean by behaviour? The way people do, the things you are doing. I'm not talking about bad just bad behaviour. Inappropriate behaviour might be something I don't want. But it's managing all of that to help learning happen. I particularly believe that every human being can respond. Every teacher, every student can respond to need. And we do. And in fact, I started, I said, with very young children. Young children frequently respond naturally. And we sort of almost train them out of responding naturally by making them behave in the ways we want them to behave. Very young children, what's the big word? Curiosity. Very young children do have curiosity. But frequently, by the time they get to... 8, 10, 15, 18, we've knocked that out of them. They've got far too many interesting things. But I would say I'm no more of an expert about learning and teaching and behaviour than you are. We're all experts together. And frequently, importantly, the students know what they need. And that was really brought to my mind when I first started working here in Jordan, which was um, just over a year ago. I'm working with Queen Rania Teacher Academy, and I'm, uh, the university is supporting them, Institute of Education is supporting the uh, um, academy in actually developing their initial teacher education diploma. And one of the first things we did as we said, we want to talk to both teachers, principals, but also we wanted to talk to children. And the children, the students in the school, we felt that they'd have something to say. And I know you came with me, in fact, when I went into one school and the students were sitting there and one boy, 10 year old, I asked the question, what would you like to tell, if, if you were the principal of the school, what would you like to tell the teachers they should be doing? And he produced from his pocket his smartphone and he said, ma'am, tell them we know it all. We want to understand it. Now, that's what I mean. Students do know. They know things because of the internet, but they want to understand what's going on. Please come in. Come in, there are some seats over here. That's all right. So I'm not going to go into this in any depth, but I am also having set out my bias. I'm going to tell you where the literature around what I've been studying is about. So developmental theories, and I'm sure as many teachers, many of you will know about those. Vygotsky, Piaget, Brunner. Attachment theory, in particular those 
four people. Um, I'm going to explore what attachment theory is in a minute, and I'm going to pull from the literature just the things I want, I think are quite important. Um, in terms of there's something else, in the UK we have something called nurture groups. And this is where a lot of the research and a lot of these practices has been happening. Um, and there are quite a few people, including myself, where we've been working in the practice setting, in classrooms where children who have not been learning have been working together and actually achieving learning. And then also in mainstream schools, there's a number of us who've been then taking this uh, research and taking it back into the mainstream schools. I told you I'd go over these quickly. My own research, I looked at secondary age boys who had been, in the UK, they'd been excluded, permanently excluded from mainstream education um, because they couldn't stay there. They, they just couldn't be coped in the mainstream classroom, usually because of very inappropriate behaviour. And I wouldn't be able to repeat some of the things they did, because particularly I'm being filmed. Um, <laughs> the, their behaviour was very poor. I worked in two schools, one in Scotland in uh, 2007 and one in the south of England in 2010. And in each case, I worked with the school with the boys over a year. How I did my research, I made observations of teachers, um, observations of the students, I looked at lots of the records, the students' work they were doing, I looked at the assessment records over a period of time, their previous school, um, how they were going on, and I also, because I'm a bit of an ethnographer in the way I, I work, I worked, I can't be in a classroom and not get involved with the, the students. So I ended up working with them as well. And, you know, it doesn't matter how an expert you are, things always go wrong. So I'm working with these students and I said, shall we do some maths now? Maths is my subject area. At this point, a boy, 12 year old, gets up and he goes underneath the table, far away from me. And he was not going to come out of there. And I couldn't get him out of there at all. Why did he do it? He hated maths. Mm -hmm. And that was how he got away from it. So the word maths was the problem there. It made him go under the table. So we all learn from everything we do. And I think good teachers often make mistakes, but it's learning from your mistakes. Let me just put into to clarity to the domains of development. Um, so these are the areas. Development for children are, are identified in three domains. The physical domain, which is about, obviously, about their physical bodies and, and so on. But remembering we can work, and, and in Jordan we were working with students in grades 4 to uh, 10. There's a heck of a change in phys physically in those students over that period of time. Um, cognitive domain, their thought processes, their thinking. Frequently, that's a domain teachers focus on. And really, we should be thinking of all three domains, the social-emotional domain. So to do with self-knowledge, self-esteem, how you feel about yourself, and so on. And those three domains are vitally important, um, plus the next bit, which is to do with um, attachment. But before I go there, in the previous session, Ken was talking about the shift from didactic teaching to constructivism. And I think there's almost, and, and particularly in many schools, a need for a further shift from constructive learning to social construction or co-construction. And I think that that's something that can frequently be missing. It's still the teacher and the students. 
um, I'm a little bit aware of at the moment, it's very much you all listening to me. I'm not over keen on that. But theories of social construct cognition com affirm the importance of recognizing and building the student's family and the community, the knowledge, building on the knowledge, but shifting it so it becomes understood. So that 10-year-old in the Jordanian school that I went to, he got it already. He knew. Um, we've got people like us, Vygotsky, Brunner, and this is a colleague at, uh, who's been at the Institute of Education. That That is a freely available reading, and it's very interesting. It's very deep but it's full of um, lots of ideas. And he and, and his colleagues, Chris Watkins, he's got a great website as well, chriswatkins.com. Um, so he said it again? Dot org. Dot net. It's one of those. Yes. <laughs> if you put Chris Watkins, you'll find it, I'm sure. Uh, brilliant website, lots of ideas. Um, not just tips for teachers, but actually underneath why these things work. Um, but on that, he actually talks about shifting from uh, didactic through to social constructivism and cycles of learning. Okay, so attachment. That's my definition of attachment. Attachment is the behaviour that maintains proximity <coughs> to another individual or restores it when it's been impaired. So, the behaviour is everything that an individual does, psychologically. All of that. Proximity is about being close to. And that we know, and the research says, that very early on, children need proximity. Babies, toddlers, they need it. In terms of attachment and proximity, there are three elements. There's modelling. The child watches their carer, usually <coughs> mum, but as I was told yesterday, frequently in Jordanian society, not mum. A nanny or a driver, as someone said. Oh, yes, the driver's the one always looking after the children. But the child, the carer is also aware of the child watching and, and as a result changes his or her behaviour because of that. Changes and then attends to the child's needs. And in a big classroom, I've been in some classrooms, 40, 60 children. Very hard to be doing that, I know. But the other element is feelings, and this is why those three domains of development are important. Both child and carer are aware of feelings and that they are okay. Now, that's quite an important idea. If you're feeling angry, you have, because something's happened, you have every right to be angry. If you're sad, you have every right to be sad. But we often tell people, you shouldn't feel like that. And actually, you do. If you're tired, or it's too hot, you feel tired. I can't say you shouldn't feel like that, you do. And um, this is very important for children in terms of attachment and proximity. Mary Ainsworth identified four types. I'm not going to go into them in depth. Those are the names of the, the securely attached. When you're securely attached, you still feel a little bit worried when you're in a strange situation. But that, that's security because you're aware of the dangers. Um, when you came to the conference, I bet it was great to find some, particularly if you're by yourself, find someone else who was 
going to the room. Oh, are you going down there? Can, can I go with you? That's an attachment issue. We all feel it all the time. But securely attached people want to reassure themselves, get the proximity back as well. The insecurely attached frequently have, sometimes they don't care at all. So an insecurely attached child might actually avoid, attack, deliberately avoid attachments, not want to be, for a whole range of reasons, perhaps because attachments they've had have not been good. Um, some of the research shows that when a baby, um, I mean a tiny baby, um, and the link between tiny babies and mothers having um, postnatal depression, the reason it needs to be managed and, and worked with is because postnatal depression can have a very big effect on the child. Not because mum's going to do anything bad, but because the attachment is not being made. So that babies, they can focus, we know from that much, that's how much they can focus. But if mother is never looking at them, they're not getting the right feedback. And all of the research shows this. There's some very interesting part in trying to look at it in monkeys and the rhesus monkeys. <coughs> there are rhesus toddlers and teenagers who are poorly attached and behave badly because, and a rhesus monkey, attachment is physical as well, they're carried as tiny babies the whole time, all the time, never put down. If mum puts them down, an aunt or some sister picks them up and carries them. But there were some that were not. And they developed into these awful teens, gangs of uh, rhesus monkeys running around and, and bullying others. So the research is, is in um, humans and in others. So the early attachment occurs in two phases. The baby up to three months, that's very much linked to the main carer. And later on, a toddler, up to three years. Toddlers feel able to go away, but they frequently then come back just to make sure you're there, all that sort of thing. That's the two areas of the attachment. So why does this happen in children's behavior? So at different ages, we expect different behavior, yeah? Obviously, three months, baby smiles, turn into mother's mother. It's fine, happens then. At nine months, the baby is able to sit, begin to explore, picks up things, explores them with everything. Feet, hands, in the mouth, turning around, looking at them. And then at 18 months, they're willing to move away from the mother. Well, how am I talking about babies? You're working with students in school. The point is that some of our students, when we observe them, actually show similar non-attachments, yes, behaviours, yes. So, have you ever seen a child who almost never smiles? A child who actually rocks or is forever putting things in their mouth? And I mean an older child, I don't mean babies now. All of that, recognizing that, is why it comes. Yes, or the but why, they keep asking, but why? But why, which is, Slightly older children do that. So the argument is that in the early learning, attachment theory and learning is seen in these contexts. Child to adult, adult to adult. Do you remember modeling? The child watches how adults interact with each other. And that's how they learn how to interact. And they copy it. 
and of course I would argue child to child peer modeling and behavior and learning are affected if the attachment has been disrupted or distorted that's what the theory is stating and um, I argue that many of your students in school who are seeming not able to engage with the learning, it may be an attachment issue. All or in a, all inappropriate or challenging behaviour that you might observe can be understood in the context of how child's attachments are developed. All of these words that you might see in your classroom. Um, I'd say, yeah, attention seeking. I'm calling out that 12 year old who keeps shouting out, Miss, what about this? Panic. When you give them something to do that they, that where you're putting them in their discomfort and they can't do it, panic. But actually the response is frequently inappropriate behaviour. I'm not doing that, particularly if they're older. Anger, restlessness, unable to sit still all the time. Um, low self-esteem. I'm no good at this. I'm rubbish. I'm stupid. All these sorts of words. So what do you do about them? The argument is that in interventions to that behaviour are offered using the knowledge of attachment theory and child development. So, let me give you an example. If a, I had a student, no, let me ask you first. Tantrums, when does tantrums start? How old are you? children when they sort of start having the tantrums too. Yeah, we use that sign, don't we? The terrible twos. Yeah? So the terrible twos. Talk on your tables, talk to each other. What do you do when a two-year-old has a tantrum? Talk to each other. Off you go. Two minutes. Talk to each other. Okay. So, this is the, the point where I ask for feedback. I'm very aware that in these short sessions, getting everybody to feedback is a challenge. And, and not there on everyone waiting for everyone to say their thing. There's a number of ways we could manage it. I can ask each table to just give one thing. I can tell you some of the things I heard as I went around. Um, and I heard similar things from a number of tables. The first one that was shouted out was, was ignore. I ignore them. Um, I'll put that one down to start with then. Ignore. So the first thing you can do is ignore behaviour. Right. This table, would you like to tell us one? How old is he? He's two. Two-year-old using yeah. words. That's very yeah. uh, impressive. Yeah. Good, great. Tell me what you want. I need to know what you want so he gets it on my time. He's not happy. I get to his level. Right. So, ask them to tell you. It's interesting. Frequently, a two-year-old is behaving like that because they can't tell you. That's why they're behaving. That's why tantrums start, because they're beginning to develop the language. And sometimes showing is, is difficult as well. But yeah, so it's one of the biggest challenges. The table. Give them a big hug. Hold them. Not too tight. Yeah? Just tight enough so they don't feel Holding is a really important thing. My son, first one I had, was in the middle of the supermarket. Um, and off it went. Now, with a two-year-old, it's so easy to do. You know, you can pick them up and you can carry them out. My shopping got left and I carried it out. <laughs> Your 15-year-old having a tantrum is not so easy. 
but a big hug or holding may be appropriate. We'll come to that one in a minute. This table. Calm them down. Talk calmly to them. Yeah? Give them some space to talk to you. Space to talk. Mind you, that might come later. You need to give them the time. Space and time is an issue. But I like the other one. You, you cheated. You've given me two now. Talk calmly. Yeah? Table over there. Did you have one? Yeah, we already said ignore. You've already said ignore. Any others? No, that's fine. I'm not, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. Anything else? This table? Distract. Thank you. Distract. You can distract children. And frequently, that's what you do. You get them, particularly two-year-olds, you get them interested in something else, yes? Or you say things like, what have I got in here? You give them something else. I have to be very careful when I ask these in different countries. Um, nobody here has said it, and I'm delighted, but uh, I did ask it in one place in India. And the answer was, the belt comes out. We say, oh my gosh, but a lot of people use that. I'm not, I'm not advocating it. What I'm saying is, that's distraction. But you can give positive distraction. So that's what you should look for, positive distraction. <laughs> Ah, oh, sometimes if it's not safe, yeah. And that's where holding comes in frequently, holding them away. I was walking back from a, a library I taught in a place called Peckham. We'd taken my, they were nine-year-olds up to the library. And um, one of the awful games that these nine, very streetwise nine-year-olds did was um, um, chicken with the traffic. It's an awful game. It's where they dodge in front of a car deliberately, step out into the road and then step back. And of course, make the cars put the brakes on. They think it's a great fun. And I had a child doing this in my, I had 30 children, and Michael was having a go at doing chicken. And I told him to stop, and he wasn't going to. He was having a great game. So I had to hold him. Um, and I had to hold him very hard, I have to say. It, and he started twisting his arm and marking himself almost. But I had to say no. And then he lifted his fist to me because he wanted me to let him go. At that time, I just said, go on, Michael. And he didn't. He thought better of it. He might have done that. I don't know. But, yes, sometimes you have to be, keep them safe as well, which actually is something I should write down. Keep them safe. Okay, so the point is, and I've given you, just given you an example, you respond to the tantrum type behavior of a nine-year-old by knowing what you would do with a two-year-old. But you do it in an age-appropriate way. At another time, I had um, students, I was in charge of the school, and it was lunchtime, and frequently lots of things go wrong at lunchtime. And uh, the students, I could hear something had gone wrong on the playground. And I went down, and there was a 10-year-old in the middle of the playground, and basically the rest of the school, including the adults, standing in a big semicircle around him. And he was yelling, swearing, screaming, uh, fighting if anyone went near him. Um, I came down, and 
the thought in my my feeling was, oh, what am I going to do? And this is what I say about your innate feeling, your innate tacit knowledge. You know. There wasn't anyone. I couldn't call on anyone else. I was in charge. But as I went into the playground, everybody, he couldn't see me because he was facing them. Everyone else saw me. They changed. Their faces showed relief. Oh, she's come. He saw that. I went up to him and talked calmly. You said calm? I just started talking in a very quiet voice. I put my arm on his shoulder and I said, I used his name, come on, let's call him Michael. Come on, Michael, it's okay. Come on, I'm here, come with me. Now what he was seeing, I, I just talked and talked and talked. I can't even remember what I said. But what he was then seeing was everyone else calming, everyone else not showing panic, but showing relief. He was in panic. He knew what he'd actually done was hit a, an adult. He'd hit one of the male supervisors. He thumped her. And he knew that was it. That was out. That was wrong. He'd lost it. And actually, he didn't know what to do. Because he knew it was wrong. But he didn't know what to do. I sort of slowly turned him round, the noise changed in the playground, I took him up to my room. I have to admit that as we were going past the wall, he gave a great big thump at the wall, and I remember thinking, thank God that wasn't me. <laughs> um, it went that way rather than this way. Got him into my room, calmed him down, and, and all the rest of it. And I didn't ask him there and then, because in this case, if I start asking a 10, 11 year old, why did you do that? He would have set off again. Yes, he, would have, he wasn't ready. We talked about it later. What was very interesting, and this is why I say behavior is everybody, was the response from the rest of the school. Because the behavior policy said, if you hit an adult, automatic, exclusion from the school. This child was always being excluded. You know, one, two, three, four days, five days exclusion. He was always being excluded. My argument was, well, it's not working, is it? All exclusion is doing is making him feel worse, certainly annoying his parents because they had to be, his mum had to be there, grandmother had to be there. Anyway, so what I did, I found out what had happened um, what had basically happened was that the adult had yelled at him, had shouted at him to do something, had actually said a not very nice word at him. She hadn't fully sworn, but told him he, told him he was stupid, this sort of thing. And so he'd hit her. And I didn't exclude him. And I nearly, I did nearly have a strike on my hands, I have to say, when all people thought I should have done. But we all had to sit down and talk about it. Ten. Uh, we all had to sit down and talk about it. And um, I had to say, as adults, we should be behaving appropriately. And actually, in this case, perhaps the adults weren't behaving appropriately. We changed our behaviour policy <coughs> after that, and instead of a whole list of if you do this, this will happen, that became an appendix, because actually in the UK you have to have a rewards and sanctions policy, but our basic behaviour policy was that at Townsend School we believe that all children, all, sorry, that everyone will behave appropriately. And then we set out who everyone was. On top of the list was teachers, teaching assistants, meal supervisors, <coughs> and children was in there. And I think that is what's really important. The community is just as important. 
I also want to say to you, that child, why was he behaving like that? He'd have a run. He's always been a bad boy, as I was told. Um, yeah. His mother had him when she was 12. So she was still a child herself. And we often find that these vulnerable children have vulnerable parents. So it's quite a, a challenging time. And she was allowed to keep them? Because she had family. She had um, grandmother. Her mother was there. And it, a lot of people feel, and I mean, I don't want to go into the ethics of it, but a lot of people feel that it's very important that children stay with their mother. <coughs> and there's a lot of evidence to say mother is the right person for a child. But I think they need to be supported as well as the other one I said. So why do they behave in an appropriate way? I want you to work on the table, make a list, and choose someone to feed back. Why? Do students behave inappropriately in your classroom? That inappropriate can be not working, behaving badly, not learning, not... So make a list on your... Someone, choose someone to write them down. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. The way we're going to feed this one back, I'm very aware of time, is just to go round, we don't, we don't want explanations, we just want to know what you've written down, tick it off. And if someone, say this group says something, what's your first one? No bond with the teacher, relationship with the teacher. If you've already got that, tick it off, I don't want to hear that from someone else. Yes? So we're going to try nice pace round the room. That's the first one. No bond with the teacher. Relationships. This person. Now you need to listen because it goes quite fast. They need more attention. Say it again, sorry. Absence of equity. Um, they need more variety. More variety. Special needs. Personal needs. <coughs> A learning difficulty. This table? They're bored. Family problems. Perhaps that's linked to personal needs, but yes, something happening in the family. This table? Uh, uh, you won't be able to hear if you are talking. Sorry, that's my teacher voice. <laughs> I apologise. <laughs> So it's too difficult for them. Yeah. They don't understand it. Too difficult. Uh, they're struggling for power. Oh, they want to to dominate. They're struggling for power. Good. Things can be too easy for them. The concept. Some things are too easy. That's like they're bored. They're, bored. they're too easy. Good. Family problems. Can I just pick it up on something you said? You said gifted. I've just computed it. No, I think that the boredom thing, or it's too easy, can be for the um, not able as well. They think it's too easy. It's underachievers. If they think it's perception. Yeah. So what did you say? Yeah, we've had family problems. Do you want another one? You see, they were, they were talking. They didn't hear the family problems. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, say it again. To escape from something. To escape from something. Frustration. Being bullied. So many or few or unclear rules. Oh, clarity, yes. 
not explained clearly. Overuse of technology. Say it again. Overuse. Yeah. Anything else? That table? No? We've had that one. Too difficult, too easy. Denial of access. Can't access it. Peer pressure. Anything else? Ah, good difference of culture. Very much so. Anything over there? Anything else? Um, Still in the same the same position for a long time. Oh, their perceptions of always being where they are. Children's perceptions, same positions. I think we've got the idea. There's lots of reasons. Um, frequently, teacher expectations. Too high, too low. Uh, tiredness. No one said hunger. Physical needs. They're worried about something. Their own expectations. You know, if a student feels they can't do something, even though you know they can, that will stop them accessing the learning. They're unhappy. The learning is too easy, too hard. The language is difficult. The culture. This is a slide I pinched from uh, Teach First is a way of initial teacher education. And they talk about what pupils, I can't change the word pupil. I know in Arabic it means the eye, but in the UK we talk about pupils as the students. What the students might be struggling with change, making friends, new arrival, lack of nourishment, the curriculum, no I said curriculum as such, the inappropriateness of the curriculum, unstable home life, puberty, big challenge. So all of those things. Okay, I want each one of you, oh, this is an individual activity, Think of one, I missed it, pupil in your classroom who you believe should be able to achieve but who is not achieving as you would expect. And it might be if you're working as a teacher educator, as a manager, it might be a teacher or, or an adult. So one learner perhaps I should say. Okay? What I want you to do is quickly Write down what they do not achieve. Now, your teachers, come on, nice and fast and snappy. Think about their behavior. How do they respond? Do they look at you? Are they quiet or outspoken? What don't they achieve? That one pupil, you've all got someone in mind who is not accessing the learning you're giving them. What do they not? What? Can't they do? Mm. Now this is an individual activity and I'm going to be I know I said social construction is very important What can't they do? What can't they do? What can they not do? So it's you thinking about your child and your student, your learner. Write down what they can't do. They can't do. Your your student, what your the learner you're thinking of, what they cannot do. And you might think, how do you know they can't do it? There's a lot of talking going on and less writing, I think. Perhaps because it's hard. 
to think, isn't it? You frequently need time and space to think about this. Practice space is quite right for it. The reason I want you to jot something down, or write something down, is because we're going to come back to this student before we finish. And now write on it, is there something you could do to change that behaviour? What they're not doing. What is it you could do to change that behaviour? Tiny little step. It's a bit like asking the Ministry of Education to uh, change the curriculum. The Ministry of Education, the Minister of Education cannot change the curriculum like that. It would, it, it's impossible. It wouldn't be allowed. There would be uproar. In fact, wasn't there recently in Jordan? Because there was a little change in the curriculum. Yeah, exactly. So, this is the same for you. Okay, so these are the slides. Colleagues, that I'm not going to go through. These are the things that could be a response to all of that. Uh, how you might enhance their learning, what sorts of things you could do. I'm not going to go through them because we're going to put them up for you. You're going to get access to them, whether it be through the Facebook or... Um, I'm not exactly sure, but I was told that's what's going to happen. One of the challenges for you is that all students learn their behaviour from somewhere. That modelling? Yeah? We see it in older students, and we know that attachment theories identify modelling as important. And sometimes behaviourist theories, those theories, the stimulus response type theory, if you do that I'll give you this, or I'll do this to you if you don't do it properly, um, can lead to learned behaviour. For example, students who are deliberately attention seeking, they have, may have learned that behaviour to get your attention to distract you from the fact that they're not doing something else. And frequently what we all do is respond to that behavior rather than think about the learning that they're distracting you from. That's an example of learned behavior. Um, for example, it's easier to be in trouble rather than getting it wrong. Others may laugh or I might get the teacher's notice. So here's another way of, this is another set, I'm not going to read them, I'm not going to go through them. These are other ways of coping with learned behavior for you, the teacher in the classroom, to improve their self-esteem. And I'm going to go to the next slide. I put this one a bit bigger because I think actually listening to them is very important. We frequently miss spotting their needs. And these are the skills we as teachers have to adapt, adapt and adopt. Okay. Think about a child who is exhibiting behaviour that you might consider childish or babyish, yeah? Got that child in your mind? You all got one in your mind? Good. How old is that behaviour? What's the age group when that behaviour first appears? 
And there's your clue, like I said with this, on how to deal with it. The needs of that age group when the behaviour first appears and are any of them applicable to the child? What I argue is we should be learning from our students. In attachment, modelling is really important. We should observe them. Observe carefully. We should be observing behaviour that we see. I think I've actually put these on the other slide. Um, be aware that what we see is influenced by our own opinions and expectations. Yesterday I said, stu these students, they know how to push your buttons. They know how to do things that get you angry or distract you. They know better than anybody. They're very good at that. But what we should do is observe behaviour and just write down what we see. The next bits I've actually put on a bigger slide because I realised it was too small. When we're recording what we see, avoid writing down judgmental words. He is rude. That's your perception. Write down what it is the student actually does that makes you think it's <coughs> rude. But write down what he does. Avoid generalizations like always calls out. Have someone else come and observe the student in your class because, and I've had it happen to me, I think he always calls out. But actually, if you actually measure how many times that student calls out, it's not that much. It's not much more than another student. But I'm, I've got that student in my mind. I've already, that student has become one of my problem students. And avoid presumptions. When you're recording observations, avoid giving the reason why. Just write down what they do. And here we are, we're going to do a little bit of observing. If you were in my session yesterday, please don't say anything. No one was, I don't think. You know this one. Ah, yeah. <laughs> please do not say anything. I want you to observe this. Remembering all those things I've just given you. There is learning going on here, and actually there's attempts at teaching. I want you to write down what you see. Okay? Hang on, I've lost the...
you see? Would you share? Sorry, I can't hear. What did you see the child? What did you see happening? Social emotional skills. Tell me what you saw. You saw that? Great. Anyone else see something different? What did you see? The baby was laughing. The father was tearing up. He's tearing up his um, redundancy notice. He's been given his redundancy notice from work. But uh, that's a different story, I think. Good. What else? It's a responsive behaviour from both the child and the parents. There's responsive behaviour from both the child and the parents. Yeah, you're all being much more analytical. I'd like you to tell me what you saw. What did the child do? He was trying to observe his father. He was observing his father. The child was trying to tear. Did you see? And what was the father doing when the child... Trying to keep him laughing. So who was becoming? What happened there? The learning stopped for the child, in a way, because actually it became the parent's want to change things, to keep him laughing. Yeah? It's actually a girl. Keep her, my cat. She's got pink on as well. Yeah, but that's very cultural. That's our culture. She's in pink. Um, so... Yeah, you could watch it to get it put on baby laughing into any search engine. But if you watch, the child is trying to do things and actually it becomes the father's agenda, keep the baby laughing, rather than the learning taking place. In fact, almost to the end, she's beginning to look around to work out, so what do they want me to do now? Do I do more laughing? Yeah. Huh? And she actually does that. So be aware of that. What is very interesting is that you were all analysts straight away. And I'm going to challenge you, all of you on that, and say actually writing down what you actually saw is going to give you more information later on so that you can analyse it. Analyse it later. Talk about it with other people. But when you observe write down exactly what you see, the events as they are. Thank you, that's a better way of putting it. The events as they are, what you actually see. Because when you then analyze it, and if you watch it lots of times, you'll see different things in there. Um, when you actually analyze it, talk about it with other people, with colleagues, I'm thinking now of you with someone in school, then actually you might come up with a solution to sorting the behaviour. Why aren't they learning? And frequently, it's what we're doing. That's stopping learning. It may be something we're doing. Um, having people... So this is something that student you thought of earlier. I then ask you to think about the relationships. Someone mentioned relationships. There is a relationship between the father and the learner. Think about your students you were thinking about. What about the relationship between you and that student? Are there things that actually, when you're in the room with the student, are stopping you from engaging and moving the learning on? Because of your agenda, because of what you feel, and your feelings are okay, just as the child's feelings are okay, but sometimes we need also to step back and see, think about it. These are some of the things I would talk, words I use in relationships. Trust. Do we have trust with our children? Does a child trust you? If you say to a child when they show you a piece of work, hmm, that's interesting. Could you just do something else? You know, the two, two wishes and uh, two stars and a wish, those types of things. Frequently, as soon as you say to a child, 
what do you think about that? They think, oh, it's wrong. Yeah? yeah? yeah. But if in your classroom you have an, um, an attitude of, it's always, we can all do it wrong. I'm a mathematician. My argument is if you're mathematics, you're always getting things wrong. Mathematicians always get things wrong. It's only every now and again that one of them finds a new proof. But they're forever getting it wrong. Scientists, the same. Yeah. Same in English, in Arabic. Beauty, I, I've been learning a great deal about Arabic working. I don't speak Arabic. I apologize for that. Um, but working with QRTA, some of the things we've done there, I've learned a lot about cl the difference between classic Arabic, standard Arabic, yes. and colloquial Arabic. And by God, just those three things mean it's a major challenge for teaching it in the classroom. So, talking to people. Relationships are really important. All these things are vital. Now, the next slides I'm going to slide across because I want to jump to the end. These are just all strategies for working with children. <laughs> so my answer is, what are you going to do next? After all of this, thinking about the behavior, what you actually see happening with the child in your classroom, and that is a Jordanian classroom. I hope <laughs> the teacher isn't here. It was a maths class that I was honored to be in. Sorry? Government school maths class. The challenge was for me, it was in full, it was all in Arabic, fully. So, uh, look back at your expectations. How well have your expectations of this been achieved? What could have been done better? And just before you go, write down three things you've learned from this session. Just write three things down. Yeah, people have been packing. I've got five minutes according to the timetable. <laughs> Uh, if your students started going before the end of the lesson, five minutes before the end, you'd be very cross with them. Three things that you think you got from this. Yes, it is. I haven't had time to go into the full depth of it all because it's a massive thing that takes... I do it over five days normally. So, yes, it is. It is possible. I'll say that at the end. Remind me if I don't. <laughs> Maybe I need to do a full course on it. So, there's been a very good question. Can you re establish attachment? And the answer is yes, you can. And in the uh, UK, these nurture groups and the research that's been done there, interestingly, 80% of the children who work in a nurture group where attachment issues are resolved are fully included back in the classroom, fully back in and don't have other, I mean they did have other problems, we have problems, all of us, all the way through life, but they, they are now able to access the group. So the answer is yes, it can be.